So let's get into section 8.3. 8.3, uh, we're going to return to something that I alluded to a couple of times. One of the great misfires of mathematical terminology, the so-called imaginary numbers. No, don't trust me with anything but that. Every classroom is always in this temperature and always so cold. I think this is cold. Yeah. Boss, you're wearing pants and dress shirt. I don't feel like a boss. I think it's a little warmer here than me, honestly. Like a boss man. But you know, I'm not from around here, so I forget. Forget the people of Southern California or not. There. I mean, when I used to water polo, like I was fine with the cold, but. Oh, yeah. That's not. It's nice during the summer, but I feel like they do it to keep us awake, too. It's not just always. See, it's it's in the winter, too. I too. When I get cold. If I could make it any warmer in here, I would not. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> you know, wear a hat. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so. Uh, Oh, but you, you, you should know that that's how, how heat is usually lost in the body's extremities. So if you put on gloves, it makes you warm, even if it wasn't your hands that were cold. It's kind of like your hands mom's hands that were most of your but Hands, your head, feet a little bit. Yeah. Put on a scarf, I'm going to water for you. <laughs> All right. That. When, it's like, when it's 90 degrees outside, I'm going to like, like yes. two. Like yes, be well bundled. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds good. All right, so... <laughs> You're familiar with the real numbers, of course. The real numbers are the numbers that you can situate on a number line. So you got your number line, you know, you got one over here, and then you got one over here. It goes forever in both directions. And every number that is on that line is a real number. The real number. The set of real numbers is sometimes designated with a bold face R. May have seen that set. And um, a number line is any type of measurement. So if you cut a length of string, for example, the length of that piece of string is a real number. Now, any real number can be measured, can be described physically. It's pretty straightforward to say, well, What's a distance of three centimeters? You know, one, two, three. There you go, three centimeters. It's not difficult to describe the idea of 3.5 centimeters. You just go half a centimeter further, there you are, no problem. Describing a distance of negative three centimeters requires orientation, it requires a starting point. But if I declare this position here to be zero, I can say, okay, three centimeters is over here, negative three centimeters is over here, no problem. Works out just fine. If I want to describe a distance of, for example, the square root of two centimeters, that's a little trickier, but it still can be done. Imagine a right angle with a distance of one centimeter in either direction. The hypotenuse of such a triangle is exactly the square root of 2 centimeters. So even though the square root of 2 is what you call an irrational number, it is a distance. It is a physical number that you can talk about that way. But then there's other stuff. Even a distance like pi can be described. All you do is make a circle with a radius of uh, half a centimeter. It's a little too big, but whatever. If the radius of a circle is one half centimeter, the diameter is one centimeter, and the circumference is exactly pi centimeters. So even though pi is not just irrational, but also transcendental, you can still measure out its length. It's, it's something that exists in a physical sense, because it's a real number. Outside of the real numbers, 
things are a little different and a little weird. The foundation of the non-real numbers is the square root of negative 1, which, as you've learned in the math class, is impossible. It isn't possible in the real numbers. But if we define numbers outside the real numbers, up here, for example, then we can represent numbers like the square root of negative 1. Now, the square root of negative 1 is not a real number, meaning you cannot cut a length of string that is i centimeters long. It doesn't make sense. You cannot make a building 40 i meters tall. There is no such thing in a physical sense. So why do they matter? Well, they can be a useful shortcut. This is something you'll start to encounter a little more in calculus, but most of the applications are a little more advanced than that. There are a fair number of situations that are easier to model if you use imaginary numbers. And you say, well, what does that matter if imaginary numbers can't exist in the real world? Well, the solutions of these problems never fall out as imaginary numbers. But by sort of tunneling through the imaginary numbers, you can get to a solution that you might not have been able to get to strictly in the real realm. For the purpose of this class, you don't need to worry too much about what an imaginary number really means. They're not all that difficult to work with. You're familiar, no doubt, with the rectangular or standard form representation of a complex number. The A plus BI, I call it the rectangular because if you graph it, it's graphed in a rectangular grid. When graphing complex numbers, and the distinction, by the way, between complex numbers and imaginary numbers is imaginary numbers is just this term. A is a real number. BI is an imaginary number. B is a real number. So we have the sum of a real and an imaginary number. Those numbers are in the complex field. The complex field is all-encompassing, meaning that real numbers are inside the complex field. Imaginary numbers are inside the complex field. So 3 is a complex number. 4i is a complex number. 2 minus 3i is also a complex number. And complex numbers are typically represented by the letter z. So you might say z equals a plus b. As opposed to using the variable x, which typically refers to a real number. You see the variable z, you'll know that's talking about a complex number. In terms of how you work with complex numbers, you can usually treat i like a variable. It's not a variable. We know what it is. It's just there's no way to write it. It's kind of like pi in that sense. So you know, if you have 3 plus 5 pi, it's 3 plus 5 pi. There's no way to combine them. But while 3 and 5 pi are both real numbers, meaning that that sum is a real number, A and BI are not both real numbers. There's no way to combine them at all. It's not a matter of it being awkward and clunky. It's that they, they're they from different universes, basically. That's just what I think. Probably rather better. What would this be used to find, for example? What value are we going to, like, would this be used? Like I said, the applications of this are a little bit beyond the scope of this class. Um, electrical engineering is a place you see it a lot. Do you have like a, like a general idea? Just because like I think it's easier to wrap your head around something if you know. Probably not. Uh, the applications are complicated enough that it would take me a long time to explain education, so it's really uh, not not conducive to uh, this class. But um, the complex numbers have slightly different properties than the real numbers. In particular. They're lacking a couple of properties. The number two, the number five, which is greater? Five. The five. So we'd be correct to say that two is less than five. How about the number eight and the number three? Number two. 
about the number negative 4 and the number negative 1? Negative 1 is greater. How about the number 2 and the number 2? They're equal. There is a, an axiom, and the axioms are the fundamental laws that define mathematics. Laws like a plus 0 is equal to a. That's the uh, identity axiom of addition. There's an axiom that states that all real numbers are related according to this trichotomy. Trichotomy meaning exactly one of these three statements is correct. Given any two real numbers, a and b, a is less than b, or a is greater than b, or a is equal to b. Exactly one of those statements is true always for all real numbers. The order properties do not apply to complex numbers. So, 2i, 5i, which is bigger? question makes no sense. It's like asking what color an A note is. How is there no value to it? There is no order to complex numbers. Complex numbers cannot be listed in any ordered sense. So it's not that 2i is less than 5i or that 5i is less than 2i. There simply is no order to complex numbers. There is no way to describe that property. They don't have it. So why the distinction? Well, because ordering is extremely important in real numbers, it's useful to be able to order things. But it's worth noting when you can't. Is it like because the number doesn't have a distance you can like think of? Ah, distance is a property that we can use, and distance is a real number, so it has an order. Here's an operation that's defined on the complex numbers. It looks like absolute value. The proper term in this context is modulus. The modulus of a complex number is a very familiar expression. If you plot real numbers and imaginary numbers on perpendicular axes as if they were x's and y's, this is analogous to distance. The distance from the origin to a complex number is what the modulus is telling us. Now, the modulus of a complex number is a real number. And therefore, moduluses have order. You can talk about, for two complex numbers, which one has a bigger modulus. But you can't talk about which one of them is bigger, because order doesn't apply to complex numbers. A couple other functions, uh, operations that we need to define on complex numbers. This is the modulus. There's also the complex conjugate. That's represented by a bar over the z. The complex conjugate works the same way as the conjugate did when we were looking at radicals. In other words, if we're looking at a plus bi, the complex conjugate is a minus bi. So if I take a complex number and multiply it by its complex conjugate, that's going to be a plus bi times a minus bi. When I multiply those, what's going to happen? It would be the difference of squares if these were real numbers. But they're not, and that changes a couple of things. You can still distribute. I'm still going to get a squared. I'm still going to get minus a b i plus a b i minus b squared i squared. You certainly can. Cancellation, according to you know additive inverse, still applies. So negative a b i plus a b i. That still cancels out. So I have a squared minus b squared i squared. 
But what about I squared? Negative one. I squared is negative one. In fact, according to some text, this is the actual definition. This is a consequence of the definition, I squared equaling negative one. That is the most important thing to remember about I. The rest of the time you can kind of treat it like a variable. But I squared is negative one, never forget that. So this is actually A squared plus, plus, B, squared. plus B squared. Oh, no. You can jump ahead if you, if you know how it works. What type of number is this? It is a real number. So, when you multiply a complex number by its complex conjugate, you get a real result. That can be used to reduce fractions involving complex numbers. Because, like with radicals, you really shouldn't leave a, an imaginary number in a denominator if you can avoid it. Okay, so those are the, the basic properties. Any questions about those? Oh, so both the modulus and the complex conjugate serve to make the imaginary number into a real number? They don't exactly make it into a real number. But you can use them to make it into a real number. You can obtain a real result. Some information is lost because there are a lot of complex numbers that have the same modulus. So it's not the same as the complex number. It's basically extracting a property of the complex number. Question? Is this sort of comparable to how we use the right triangle to find attributes of an angle that we don't know the current code? Yes, yes. If you go further into mathematics, you will eventually encounter a concept called orthogonal decomposition. And basically, these are all variations of orthogonal decomposition where if I'm at some arbitrary angle, it's easier to understand right angles. So I can decompose whatever it is that I'm working on into an orthogonal setup, namely a right angle. And uh, in that way, the properties are a little easier to work with. My other question is, so we know that, uh, say, 2i two two, two and 5i are not comparable. Right. But we can say that because that works, because 2abi and uh, positive abi, they, they cancel out. 2i and 2i are equal, right? Yes, yes. It is true that equality still applies to complex numbers, but greater than and less than do not. Okay, so graphing complex numbers isn't too complicated, despite the name. If I wanted to graph, say, z1 equals 2 minus 5i, a rectangular grid is used where the horizontal axis is the real axis and the vertical axis is the imaginary axis. As far as how you graph it, it works exactly the same to x's and y's, except we're talking about reals and imaginaries. Yes, I would go two units to the right along the real axis, five units down along the imaginary axis, and have a position here. Well, I can't compare Z1's order, but 2 is a real number, and 5 is a real number. Oh, it's more complex. Can I get the coordinates have order. The points don't. Oh, I see. But the graph would like, trace like, the order. Right. So like, by way of comparison, consider the point Z2 equals uh, 5 minus, well, let's say negative 5 plus 2. So that's going to go 5 units to the left along the real axis and 2 units up along the imaginary axis leading to here. I feel like we made a different kind of, like it's not a normal grid, it's different. It's a rectangular grid, but the axes represent different concepts. So you can see how the question, which of these numbers is bigger, doesn't make a lot of sense. Certainly, z1 has a greater x, sorry, a greater real component because 2 is greater than negative 5. z2 has a greater imaginary component because 2 is bigger than negative 5. But the numbers themselves can't be compared. 
Now, I can find the modulus of them. That shouldn't be a problem. If I wanted to find the modulus of Z1, how would I find it? The square root of? Right. 2 squared plus negative 5 squared. The modulus operation does not incorporate the imaginary number at all. Only the coordinates, so to speak. So that would be the square root of, yes, uh, 29. What's the modulus of Z2? It's also square root of 29. If I were to ask you, is Z1 greater than Z2, that is a question that makes as much sense as, uh, you know, what does salt taste, uh, what, what color does salt taste like? It, unless you have synesthesia, there is no color to play for it. It just doesn't make sense. Question? What was the point of the modulus? Uh, modulus is something that we're going to use for another operation in a moment. Um, it's a way of getting towards something similar to the magnitude of a uh, uh, complex number. Is modulus always positive? Yes. Modulus is defined to be the principal square root. That term is going to make a lot more sense tomorrow. I've used it a couple times. It's not one we've maybe heard before. But the principal square root is positive by definition. So whenever you see that radical symbol, positive is implied. If it were negative, you'd put the negative out in front so you would know. Okay, so what if I conjugated Z2? What is the complex conjugate of Z2? Negative 5. Minus 2i. Negative 5 minus 2i. What if I took Z2 times its complex conjugate? Negative 5 minus 2i. 25 plus 4i. But isn't that you? Like, what I'm confused about is like, if we can get a value for it, like a real number, or right. a value of it, are we not able to compare it? Well, sure. With something else. What is Z1 times its complex conjugate? Same thing. Are they the same thing? Are Z1 and Z2 the same number? One's here, one's there. This is what I'm saying. These are properties of those numbers. They're not those numbers. There are a whole lot of complex numbers that have the same modulus. They're not the same number, though. There are a whole lot of complex numbers that if you multiply their conjugate, you get the same result, but they're not the same number. Just like if I add 3 plus 5, I get an 8. If I add 2 plus 6, I also get an 8. That doesn't mean 3, 5, oh, 2, and 6 is the same thing. However, You may have noticed that in both of these cases, the product of a complex number and its conjugate is equal to the square of the modulus. Not a coincidence. In fact, this can be proven fairly easily. Yeah, and you can just to be generally like a plus b squared. Yeah. So this isn't a complex analysis class, I don't want to get too far into the weeds there, but I do want to talk about operations on complex numbers. When you're performing operations on complex numbers, remember, you can treat i like a variable most of the time. The difference being if you have i squared. That has to be restated as negative 1. So if I were to take, for example, um, 2 minus 7i and multiply that by 13 plus i. 
I would distribute, just like I did when I was proving the uh, product of a, a complex number and its conjugate. 2 times 13 is 26. 2 times i is 2i. 7i times 13 is minus 91i. And 7i uh, times i is going to give you minus 7i squared. So it's plus 7 Correct. You can combine like terms and get 26 plus well, not minus 89i plus 7, which is 33 minus 89i. There is a concept in mathematics called closure. It applies to sets and operations. When it is possible to perform an operation on any two numbers in a set and you stay in the set, that's closure. That is a closed operation. So, for example, hmm? white teeth. The set of integers are closed under addition. If you add two integers together, you get an integer, always. If you subtract two integers, you get an integer, always. So it's closed under subtraction. The set of integers is closed under multiplication. If you multiply any two integers, you get an integer. Is the set of integers closed under division? Is it possible to divide two integers and not get an integer? It certainly is. Two divided by three is not an integer. So, the set of integers is not closed under division. The set of rational numbers is, provided you don't divide by zero, which we're usually allowed to skip. If you divide any two rational numbers, you get a rational number, unless the bottom one was zero, which, like I said, we can pretend that, that didn't happen. So, looking at complex numbers, complex numbers are closed under addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Again, provided you don't divide by zero. Which means that if you add two complex numbers, you subtract two complex numbers, you multiply two complex numbers, or you divide two complex numbers, you will get a complex number. And they can always be expressed as a plus bi. That is the correct form that your results should be in. If it looks like anything else, it's not simplified. For example, suppose I wanted to take 2 minus 7i and divide it by 13 plus i. That's a complex number, which means it should be expressed as a plus bi, some real component, some imaginary component. How can I simplify that? Complex conjugate of the denominator. Of course, we've done a similar operation in rationalizing the denominator, so that's not exactly new. It's not going to play out the same. The numerator is going to be 26 minus 2i minus 91i plus 7i squared. The denominator will be 169 plus 1 using the same logic as multiplying complex times with that. If you don't remember the shortcut, just multiply it out and you get the same result. It's fine. That's going to be 170 on the bottom. On the top, I'm going to have 26 minus the 7 over there is going to give me 19 minus 93i. If I want to write this in standard form, it would be 19 over 170 minus 93 over 170i. That way you have your real component, you have your imaginary component. Ah, are we going to do the same? Or? Good question. Um, yes, but there's a little bit of uh, discussion to be had there. We'll get to that in just a moment. That's definitely the next topic. Other questions about this operation? You want to be a little cautious about this because those negatives can get you flipped around if you're not paying attention. 
and negative is sort of inherent to I. So there's always negatives flying around, even if they are invisible. So be, be cautious. Now, to Hart's question. I squared is negative 1. What's IQ? Negative 5. That's correct. How do you figure? Uh, I just multiply I squared to I. Right. So i cubed is negative i. i is, of course, i. i squared is negative 1. What about i to the 4? Uh, I can separate i of the fourth into i squared times i squared. Which is negative 1 times negative 1, which is 1. So what's i to the fifth? I. I. What's i to the sixth? Negative 1. Negative 1. What's i to the seventh? Negative i. Negative i. What's i to the zero power? 1. one. one. Everything's a zero power. One. That's an energy. Well, okay. Zero to zero power is indeterminate, but uh, everything else is. Yeah. It's i to the first thing. So if I consider i to the nth power, 1, i, negative 1, negative i, 1, i, negative 1, negative i, the powers of i are periodic. Periodic meaning they cycle through the same values infinitely in the same pattern. I to the nth power is always going to be 1 i negative 1 or negative i. It will never be anything other than those four. Now determining which one is pretty easy, there's a couple of options you can use. Let me just demonstrate that. Suppose I have i to the 713th power. Now, I know it's one of those. To determine which, people use different methods. Here's the method that I prefer. Pull off one eye. I to the 713th power is equal to I times I to the 712th power. I to the 712th power is I squared to some kind of power. What power? Zero six. Uh, not quite. Oh, it's multiplying by one. You're close. You're one digit off. Three hundred fifty-six. Three fifty-six. Oh, whoa. What is I squared again? Negative. negative one. What is negative one of the three hundred fifty-six power? One. I couldn't calculate that negative one. Negative one to the three hundred fifty-six power? I got negative one. That's because you did it wrong. I got negative one. I did. If you use parentheses, you'll be yeah. all right. Yep. Isn't it, as long as it's an even number, right? It'll always return one, right? Like if it was. If yes, it was negative one to any even power would always be one, right? Some people memorize the entire four cycle. And they divide the exponent by four, the remainder tells you which point in the cycle you hit. That makes sense to me, doesn't it? If that works for you, that works. Nothing wrong with that. Oh. Uh, so if we divide the 712 uh, by four, if we get. Oh, you, you, you skip, you skip the, the first step. You take 713 divided by four. Oh, yeah. Uh, if the reminder is 0. Uh, 0.25, so 0. 0.25, right. it's I. Right. In this case, the remainder is 1. So, Or if you divide your calculator, you, you look at what the decimal is, 0.25. Yes, that, that's. And that works perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm, I'm OK with that. If that's how you answer a question like this, uh, show your logic. But that logic is good. So 
complying with any of those? So it's point two five. We do like if the, if the so decimal ends up being point two five, the result is high. Oh, so you would then so it's like whatever the decimal is that tells you whatever what is that divided by four, whichever like step it is. That exactly. Is, okay. Exactly. So if it's point two five. You're looking at one fourth. So it's high. yeah. Okay. Point five, two fourths. Point seven five, three fourths. Four fourths. And then if you get no the remainder. No remainder. Yeah. Okay. So that works too. But. Why are we doing all of this in this class? Because it's going to be a it's not great. <coughs> this is related to what we've been doing so far. The powers of I are what now? Periodic. Periodic. Which means there is also a trigonometric representation of complex numbers. Because it makes working with them so much easier. Oh my goodness, yes. I'll demonstrate.